You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm. But even then, he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. It's time now for the conservative... It's time now for the conservative curmudgeon radio show. Now, here's Grouchy. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in. Good to be back with you. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late getting rolling here. Uh, You don't need to know why. We'll just call it technical difficulties and leave it at that. (laughs) Anyway, uh, let's see. What's going on? We got some fun. Yeah, we got a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, we We got a big, huge story to talk about that nobody's been talking about. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to bring this one out to the forefront because it's going to be important in the long run. 
Uh, we're gonna get we're gonna kick off with that. But uh, before we even kick off, programming reminder: following me immediately tonight on KLRN Radio is Fubar with Polita Bunny and Ordy Packard. You don't want to miss out on that fun. Uh, it'll it'll be just as good as it always is. I guarantee it. After that, uh, Rick, you still in that slot? Si, sí, senor. I actually sí, have guests coming in actually, yeah. tonight. I'm sorry, what's that? I actually have guests coming in tonight. Guests. You have guests tonight? Yes. Yeah. Wow. I know. Wow. Right? I know. Fancy schmancy. I'll tell you what. Things are picking up around this joint. Uh, and then after you, Jesse's POV, right? That would be a negative, that, sir. She's going back to Tuesday, okay. Thursday only, so we don't have anything in the late night slot right now. Okay. Well, so there you have it. Now now we are back to the triple crown of conservative talk radio, the trifecta, if you will. Um, it is what it is. Uh, right here at KLRN Radio every Wednesday night, it's still the place to be. So buckle in. You got three great hours ahead of you here. All right. So what's this big story? Well, I'm going to tell you what this big story is. Uh, our newly fully constituted Supreme Court, now with Associate Justice Brett Kavanaugh, uh, has agreed to hear a case that could determine whether users can challenge social media companies on free speech grounds. Now, the case, and you can look this up, it's Manhattan Community Access Corporation v. Halleck. The case number is 17-702. It centers on whether a private operator of a public access television network is considered a state actor, which can be sued for First Amendment violations. Now, the case uh, obviously centers around that specific issue, but it could have broader implications for social media and other media outlets. Uh, in particular, a broad ruling from the high court uh, could open the country's largest technology companies to First Amendment lawsuits. Now, that could shape the ability of companies like Facebook, Twitter, and even Google to control the content on their platforms as lawmakers are already clamoring for more regulation and, and activists on the left and right spar over issues related to censorship and harassment. Now, the Supreme Court accepted the case on Friday. Uh, it is the first case taken by the reconstituted court after adding Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, on his contentious confirmation. On its face, it has nothing to do with social media at all. Uh, rather, the facts of the case concern public access television and two producers who claim they were punished for expressing their political views. Uh, the producers, Didi Halleck and Jesus Melendez, say that Manhattan Neighborhood Network suspended them for expressing views that were critical of the network. Now, in making the argument to the justices that the case was worthy of review, attorneys for um, Manhattan Neighborhood Network said the court could use the case to resolve a lingering dispute over the power of social media companies to regulate the content on their platforms. Interesting how they brought that up. Uh, while the First Amendment, Amendment is meant to protect citizens against government attempts to limit speech, there are certain situations in which private companies can be subjected to First Amendment liabilities. So attorneys for uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network have made the case that social media companies are clearly not government actors, but in raising the question, they have provided the Supreme Court with an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, they say that, we, that they understand at a moment when the very issue at heart of this case, the interplay between private entities, non-traditional media, and the First Amendment has been playing out in the courts, in other branches of government, and in the media itself. Attorneys for MNN wrote their uh, 
final plea to the justices to take up the case. So, you know, a ruling against MNN on the broad question it has asked the court to consider could open social media companies to First Amendment suits, which would force them to limit the actions they take to control the content on their platforms. The court could also rule uh, more narrowly against MNN in a way that doesn't impact the companies. The case is likely to get extra attention as it moves forward, uh, given lawmakers increasing attacks against social media companies for perceived partisanship. Uh, those attacks have raised the specter uh, that the court, which has served as a bulwark for conservative expression, could step in. I, I don't see that as being a factor in this, but, you know, I guess you never can tell. We'll have to watch it and see. Um, some observers have expressed caution, saying that the justices are unlikely to rule in a way that could substantially impact social media companies. Uh, Michael Pactor, a former tax attorney who covers Twitter as an analysis at uh, Wedbush Securities, said he thought it was extremely unlikely that the court will issue a ruling that hamstrings social media companies, particularly given the court's deference to business interests. Uh, if the court does place serious limits on how the companies can restrict the speech on their platforms, he said it would make the networks more hostile, alienating their users and advertisers. I see, I have the opposite take. Okay. And, and you guys have all heard this before. We're all out there on Twitter. Um, you know, they give us a mute button. They give us a block button. Use it. There's no need for them to be policing speech unless it's of a truly threatening nature. Unless it's like law breaking, human trafficking, slavery, death threats, terrorist threats. That's where they need to be policing. Not somebody telling you to go piss up a rope because you're a conservative or you telling somebody to pull their head out of their ass because they're a liberal. It, you know, let's get back to the good old days of Twitter. I remember when I first came to Twitter and, man, it was madness. It was great. It was all open arguing and it didn't matter. Nothing got you thrown off of Twitter. But that's not like that anymore. So where are we at now? Well, this guy Pactor says that Twitter is an uncivil place as it is, but it will become less civil. You know, so what? Again, block button, mute button. You don't have to put up with it. Courts in California and New Jersey have weighed in on the issue, finding that social media companies don't constitute state actors subject to First Amendment liability. A federal judge in New York ruled in May that the First Amendment protected users interacting with parts of Twitter, uh, including the president's feed, but that ruling didn't apply to Twitter as a whole. The Supreme Court addressed a related issue in June of 2017 in Packingham versus North Carolina, uh, case number 15-1194, the court struck down a state law that prohibited sex offenders from accessing social media sites. Uh, in his opinion for the court, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who retired over the summer, referred to social media sites as a modern public square. But the court's decision left important questions about what exactly that meant up in the air. Now, while the justices tend to describe themselves as being apolitical, uh, the court of Chief Justice John Roberts has shown a distinct preference for speech cases that concern conservative ideology, according to an empirical analysis conducted by researchers affiliated with uh, Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Michigan, two hugely liberal bastions of uh, hope and help. Um, their analysis found that the justices on the court appointed by Republican presidents 
sided with conservative speech nearly 70% of the time, nearly 70% of the time, two out of three, roughly, three out of four, maybe, but we didn't even go over 70, so probably closer to two out of three. Uh, more than any other modern court, the Roberts Court has trained its sights on speech promoting conservative values, the authors found. And again, take this with a grain of salt. We're, we're citing liberal, basic, you know, baby liberal think tanks here. These are universities. This is not impartial by any means. Uh, polls show that both Democrats and Republicans believe that social media companies censor their users. However, the issue swings heavily conservative. 85% of Republicans believe that social media companies censor speech the companies find objectionable, compared with 62% of Democrats. Still overwhelming majorities, either way. Uh, and that survey was conducted, conducted by uh, Pew Research Center. So uh, the survey also found that 4 in 10 Americans believe the companies favor liberal speech versus just 1 in 10 who believes the companies favor conservative speech. So there's obviously a slant on how they're seen. Hmm, pardon me. I'm trying to develop hiccups here. Uh, in August, President Trump blasted Google for allegedly suppressing conservative speech. Uh, in a post on Twitter, Trump wrote that they are controlling what we can and cannot see, and this is a very, situa very serious situation that will be addressed. Now, for what that's worth, throw that out the window, okay? Throw it out the window. If he wanted to do something, he shouldn't have told him he was going to do something. Because they can drop an algorithm and correct whatever they were doing before in a, in a heartbeat. So Representative Devin Nunes of California, the conservative chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, in July accused Twitter of censorship and threatened legal action. And perhaps most dramatically, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Apple, and the music platform Spotify removed all the content from right-wing conspiracy theorist and uh, tinfoil hat provocateur Alex Jones in August, accusing the talk show host of violating their terms of service. Now, certainly uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network cited Jones's removal in a legal brief, saying it was an example of the heightened attention of the issue of First Amendment rights online. The uh, major social media companies, uh, which either did not respond or declined uh, to comment on this topic, have said that they do not censor speech based on political ideology. In August, as the uproar from conservatives reached a fever pitch, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey called into the radio show hosted by conservative commentator Sean Hannity. Um, what he said was that they do not shadow ban according to political ideology or viewpoint or content, period, said Dorsey. Uh, for its part, Google has released a statement saying that its search feature is not used to set a political agenda and we don't bias our results toward any political ideology. <clears throat> During an April hearing before the Senate's Commerce and Judiciary Committees, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg was grilled by Senator Ted Cruz about whether Facebook considered itself a neutral public forum. <clears throat> there are a great many Americans who I think are deeply concerned that Facebook and other tech companies are engaged in a pervasive pattern of bias and political censorship, Cruz said. Uh, in response, Zuckerberg said that Facebook is a platform for all ideas. So again, um, this, this is huge that the Supreme Court's going to take this case up first. Uh, huger yet are the possible implications for social media companies moving forward. It's going to take some time to watch this all play out and see what happens and, you know, who's where and, and why. But um, I'm, I'm looking forward to keeping up with this particular case and, and see where it goes. 
Anyway, moving right along. Uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell rejected criticism that last year's Republican tax cuts are to blame for the ballooning federal budget deficit. Yes, you heard me right. We talked about this a little bit last week. Um, the deficit is up. It's the highest it's been in six years. And the Democrats are blaming the tax cuts. Now, McConnell turned around and said that uh, he blames the deficit on the fact that the left is unwilling to work on large federal spending programs that are continually the problem. Uh, McConnell called the rising deficit very disturbing, uh, said there was not much of a chance Republicans could cut mandatory spending programs such as Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid next year uh, if they maintain, maintain control of Congress because any such changes would need leadership from the Democrats in order to pass the legislation. Now, McConnell's remarks came a day after a Treasury Department report said the budget deficit soared 17% from last year uh, to $779 billion in President Trump's first fiscal year in office. And again, this is the highest it's been in six years. Now, Democrats had warned during the tax cut debate that the plan would boost the deficit through tax reductions and then seek to make up those losses by cutting social programs. Well, you know what? There are a lot of social programs that need to be cut. There's a lot of funding going on out there that we don't need to be providing for. And I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind, that $779 billion could be trimmed from our national budget and zero out the deficit for next year. Now, who's willing to give up their pet projects to do that? That's a good question. I guarantee you though, I guarantee you that it's not anybody on the left. Now, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi seized on McConnell's comments saying, like clockwork, Republicans in Congress are setting in motion their plan to destroy the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security that seniors and families rely on just months after they exploded the deficit with their tax scam for the rich. Now, you know, I'm sick of hearing this. I really am. Um, I'm not rich. Believe me, I'm not rich. I am the epitome of middle class. The tax cuts helped me. They helped me greatly, and I'm appreciative for them. I like keeping more of my paycheck. Most people do. But I can promise you, for those of you out there that are such ardent objectors to the tax cuts, that our United States Treasury will gladly accept you writing a check to them for the additional money. So put your money where your mouth is or shut your pie hole. Now, Republicans did spend a lot of time during the Obama administration slamming him over deficits um, and hypocritically have ignored the rising deficit mostly during Trump's time in office so far. So there's enough blame to go around here. Don't get me wrong. Okay. And although McConnell blamed the deficit on social programs, um, you know, we can easily see fat in the budget that needs to be trimmed. It's not hard. It's really not. It's, it's, it's really more about, people being unwilling to make the cuts. Okay. That they don't want to, they don't want to move spending caps. They don't want to, they don't want to eliminate any categories that are possibly receiving uh, benefits. 
It, you know, look, here's here's a quick one. Here's one hundred and twenty billion dollars a year right off the top. OK, quit funding everything for illegal immigrants. No benefits. Cut them out. You know, there are American citizens that need benefits that can't get them, but illegals can get them. There's an easy $120 billion right off the top. That's, uh, let's see, that's, that's what, about 120 into 780, well, one-sixth of the, of the deficit, just like that. One sixth, one fifth, somewhere around 17 to 20 percent gone, just like that. Boom. Easy fix. Now, let's talk about that deficit a little more. Okay. Our federal government collected a record. Let me let me count my zeros here real quick. Uh, yeah. $1.683 trillion in individual income taxes in fiscal 2018. So, so right off the bat, we shoot the Democrats' argument right out of the water. Okay, they, they blame the deficit on the tax cuts, but yet we took in a record, record amount of individual income taxes even after the tax cuts. However, federal government also ran a deficit of $778.996 billion. So um, the debt of the federal government, as opposed to the deficit, increased by $1.271 trillion. The previous record for income tax collections in a fiscal year was $1.634 trillion. So we, we came up, uh, what, um, $50 billion. $50 billion more after the tax cuts. Think about that, okay? $50 billion more from 350 million people of which about half work. So despite the record amount collected, uh, overall federal tax revenues were lower than the, free, the previous three years because of total numbers. Okay. Now, what we're not seeing yet is we're not seeing taxes collected on re repatriated corporate money. We're only dealing with individual taxes here in this. So it's, it gets to be a little hairy, but it's okay. It's okay. So while it was collecting more from individuals, it was collecting less from corporations. Now, what's the difference? Well, the difference was only $313 billion. So even if you add the extra 50 onto the 313 deficit, you're still only at $365 billion. Okay. But again, we haven't started repatriating the money from these corporations. When we do, that money will get added back to the kitty, and we'll see the deficit shrink from that. Now, are there other things that need to be done? Yes, there are. I'm not blowing this away at all. Shame on the Republican majority for not handling this issue. Shame on the Democrats in the minority for trying to use it for political gain, knowing that they are tax and spend experts and they know how to play that game. They claim that Trump's tax cuts are for the rich and they don't help Americans. I'm here to tell you they do. I see it in my paycheck all the time. Okay. Uh, 
Every Democrat that's running for office right now, I want to hear what their plan is to help the American people. They say they have better plans for American people. What are they? A higher taxes and open borders? That doesn't help me. That doesn't help most people. All right. We're at the bottom of the hour. I know we're going to take a short break. We, we got started a couple minutes late. I think Rick's going to queue up the short break for us. Uh, we should be back in probably about, what, two minutes, Rick? Ish, yeah. Yeah, two-ish. So run and get your drink and get yourself back. We'll be right back. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Evil shenanigans. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Uh, just a quick reminder, right after me, Fubar with the bunny and the Amish guy. Uh, then America off the rails, your trifecta of conservative talk right here on KLRN Radio. Okay. So, uh, President Trump and in turn now his Health and Human Services Department wants pharmaceutical companies to include list prices in television commercials hawking their prescription drugs. Right now, drug companies are required to disclose a drug's major side effects, but not the effect that buying that drug could have on your wallet. So HHS said in its announcement Monday that patients deserve more transparency. Now, this proposal would require television advertisements for prescription drugs, the ones that are paid for by Medicare or Medicaid, to include the list price if that price is greater than $35 for a month's supply or the usual course of therapy. The prices would be required to be updated quarterly if there's a change. HHS said the 10 most commonly advertised drugs have list prices ranging from $535 to $11,000 a month or for the normal course of therapy. $11,000 a month. 
HHS noted that many patients pay either list price or prices based on list price. Well, all prices are based on list price. They're discounted from it or they pay the full. Brilliant. These people are running our country, by the way. So the proposed regulation is part of the American Patients First Blueprint announced in May by President Trump and Secretary Alex Azar. That blueprint laid out four strategies, boosting competition, enhancing negotiation. Ooh, can we waterboard pharmaceutical companies to get them to lower prices? I can get on board with that. Uh, creating incentives for lower list prices and bringing down out-of-pocket costs to patients. Now, uh, appearing on CNBC's Squawk Box on Tuesday, uh, Secretary Alex Azar said that we think it's critical that patients being pitched these medicines and asked to go talk to their doctor about these drugs, uh, that while they currently get the medical efficacy and safety concern information in the ads, they're not being told the prices of the very medicine that they're being asked to have a discussion about. And that list price, what the administration thinks is part of a fair balance, that it ought to be in the ads. And that's why the president committed to proposing a regulation that would mandate prices in the ads. That's what we delivered on yesterday. Pharmaceutical companies set the list price. Azar said that uh, many people, including Medicare recipients and younger people with high deductible health plans, pay list price until they meet their deductible. So I'm not buying that the pharma talking point that list prices don't matter. They do matter, Azar said. Right now, the proposed regulation is focused on television ads. Azar said the requirement may ex uh, eventually expand to include direct-to-consumer magazine and internet ads. Again, I think good idea. Why not? He also noted that the pharmaceutical in industry could have voluntarily agreed to disclose list prices in their advertising, but they didn't do it. So they're going to go with a regulation uh, if people believe in transparency. They say that is the way to go. So, you know, I don't have a problem with this. Normally, I'm not big on regulations. I don't, I don't like getting into that uh, with government. But this doesn't hurt the business in any way. They're not telling them that they have to set a price at this level. All they're saying is you have to show people the price. What's the harm in that? So the Trump administration is also working on a plan to get doctor's offices involved in list price disclosure. That gets a little hairier because typically they don't provide the medication. They simply would write the prescription for it. Now, Again, this gets real hairy in the doctor's office side because you're talking about having to stop or stop and make calls to a pharmacy to see what the, the medication runs. Or you're talking about pharmaceutical companies having to put out price flyers monthly or quarterly or something of that nature to every doctor's office. Again, it's a nightmare either way. So I don't know about the doctor's office side of it. I do agree that you have a right to know, not just when you have the TV ad, uh, what the drug ought to cost, but actually at the point of prescribing when you're with the doctor. Uh, I, I get that. I, I get you should know, but you should know before you go to the doctor. Okay? And again, can do the doctor's office have staff that can call the pharmacy and find out what it's going to cost? Yeah, they do. But if they do that for every single person, you're talking that, I mean, it's, you're talking about hours a day at any kind of, you know, sizable practice that's going to be added to the workload. They're already packed. 
So, you know, what what are the tools? It, 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 you know, are they are they going to have you got to have something in place that's going to allow a doctor to have instant access to the price. And I don't know what that tool is. Okay. Uh, I, I do. I think it's great that they be able to tell you. Sure. Sure. I just don't know what the mechanism is going to be. I'll wait. I'll have to wait because I don't know. They're not telling us yet. <clears throat> anyway. Um, ah, Ideally, you'd like to have more than one, you know, source of medicine competing for your money. That would help drive price down too. Uh, you don't let them get into a fixed game. Uh, competitive discussions uh, at the point of the scripts getting written. Uh, Azar said he hopes that insurance companies who try to steer patients toward a particular medication under their benefit plans. Uh, will develop the tools to help patients find the lower cost option. Ozar also expressed concern about the rebate system, which creates the incentive for extremely high list prices. Uh, what Azar thinks they should be doing instead is uh, considering pulling those rebates forward to the point of sale when the patient walks into the pharmacy. Let the patient get that discount when they walk in instead of having to wait six weeks to get it back at home. Uh, you know, he says that's an idea worth all of us thinking about. It would be more transparent. It would create a disincentive to these absurd list prices and constant list price increases, and it would decrease spending for patients at the pharmacy. Uh, so that's something that we all need to be thinking about in our system. So, you know. Okay, whatever. Drug prices are high. We all know this. Anybody that's having to take any kind of medication for anything knows that, I mean, yeah, you can get generics for 4 and $6, but, you know, what, what happens when you get that prescription that there's no generic for? Um, you know, some of those medicines are outrageous. Outrageous. Anyway, what's next? What's next? Um, yeah, oh, well, over the past few days, and, you know, let's, let's just be real here. It's been more than the past few days. It's been several months. It's been a year. Okay? But over the past few days particularly, President Trump has rightly singled out high-ranking Democratic support for mob mentality. Now, I know all kinds of media outlets and politicians are having a conniption over the use of the word mob. Well, guess what? That's, that's what it is. And there's no sense in trying to sugarcoat it. Just take it for what it is. No, it's not just people being upset. You don't, you don't assault people. You don't batter people because you're upset. But speaking in Iowa, President Trump told a crowd of about 9,000 that the Democrats were an angry mob pushing policies of anger, division, and destruction. He said, you don't hand matches to an arsonist, and you don't give power to an angry left-wing mob, and that's what the Democrats are. Democrats, uh, rightly so fired back that Trump has spent a lot of his political, um, I, let's call it a career, okay, for lack of a better word, uh, much of his time in politics operating off anger and that he hasn't been averse to using violent rhetoric when it seems useful. Now, that's just a form of whataboutism and an insufficient response to the Democrats' open embrace of mob behavior over the past few weeks and months. In the last, what, 72, 96 hours, something like that, Hillary Clinton has called for an end to civility with Republicans until such time that Democrats are back in power. Former Attorney General Eric Holder 
said when they go low, we kick them. And Miss I Have a Pineapple Instead of a Head, Maisie Hirono from Hawaii, uh, refuses to even push back a little bit against leftist activists who are confronting Republicans in restaurants. You know, the latest examples uh, fall, fall hard on Democrats like uh, Representative Maxine Waters of California, uh, openly encouraging confrontation in public spaces with Republicans. Americans can see the effect of Democrats' decision to tut-tut mobs. We can see it in the thousands of people who showed up at the Occupy, uh, to occupy the Senate Hart Building in order to harass senators. Uh, we can see it in the mobs braying and pounding against the doors at the Supreme Court like they were trying to break into a Chick-fil-A on Sunday. We can see it in the groups who have hounded Republicans ranging from Ted Cruz to Kirsten Nielsen to Sarah Huckabee Sanders to Mitch McConnell and Elaine Cho in public spaces. Ted Cruz the other night with his wife in D.C. run out of a restaurant. But the media are now engaging in the most asinine gaslighting tactic. They're claiming that even as top Democrats wink and nod at the mob, that there's no such thing as a leftist mob. And even acting with incredulity at the idea, Brooke Baldwin on CNN, uh, saying that there were absolutely no mobs, mobs had nothing to do with the Kavanaugh uh, saga confirmation hearings, testimony afterwards, the expanded investigation and its resulting testimonies. No mob involved in any of that whatsoever, even though there are photographs and video of people outside of the, of the um, chambers being paid, protesters, that were photographed inside and outside while outside getting paid wearing the same clothes inside. It's out there, folks. It's out there. They were paid to protest, but it's not a mob. <clears throat> Don Lemon basically did the same thing on CNN, yelling at anyone who would claim that Democrats were acting in mob-like fashion. Uh, the Washington Post ran this headline, an angry mob, colon, Republicans work to recast Democratic protests as out of control anarchy. Well, I think when you're, uh, when you're having enough anarchy in, in Senate chambers to disrupt a confirmation hearing, then yes, yes, it is out of control. These same members of the media were more than happy to label the Tea Party as a mob or as terrorists. Terrorists. Okay? According to many members of the media, there is no such thing as a left-wing mob. Those are just angry people. And there's, there's no such thing as a right-wing protest. There are only angry racist mobs. Now, if you didn't believe in a media bias before, after watching this kind of reaction, how can you not now? You know, more, you want more? Uh, a Republican running for a seat in the Vermont House of Representatives uh, received a death threat and rape threats from an alleged socialist, Desiree Morin of Colchester, Vermont, uh, published a photo of the vulgar letter. It, it was put together like the BTK killer. Cut out block letters and magazine words and things like that and glued into the letter. Come on. She's running for office. She's not making any policy. Look, Rand Paul was attacked at home by a neighbor. Steve Scalise was shot on a baseball field during practice for a charity game. The Kavanaugh hearings, 
paid protesters. Leftist politicians are inciting violence via its leadership against anybody who dares think differently than they do. Democratic leadership is only adding to the problem with the winks and nods to the masses. It would do them well to remember the monster that they are trying to create. It was just over a year ago. Remember Nancy Pelosi trying to give a speech to the dreamers and they shouted her down and ran her off? She talked about how they were out of control and wild animals even. Animals! She called them wild animals. How dare she talk to dreamers that way, right? Frankenstein does not learn the lesson and tries to recreate a new monster now. And I guarantee you, it'll backfire on them again. It's just amazing how short their memories are. How long are people like Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, uh, Maxine Waters, Cory Booker, Kamala Harris, Maisie Hirono, and others in the Democratic Party, they, they just turn a blind eye. They turn, not only do they turn a blind eye, they foment this behavior. A Minnesota Democrat Party has suspended a spokesman calling for violence against Republicans, even as two GOP candidates have been assaulted in suspected politically motivated attacks. Come on. Let's get right, people. It, you know, it's, it's not just an isolated incident here or there. We've got bricks being thrown through uh, campaign office windows. We've got threats being leveled. Um, you know, it's, it, it knows no boundaries. It knows no states. It, it's just ridiculous. And what are we going to do? You either fight back and become part of the mob or you suffer the consequences. I'm all about fighting back to a point. I beat them down, I make them submit, and then it stops. It's kind of the Israel philosophy. You want peace? Lay down your arms. You want to go to war? We'll go to war. Anyway, don't listen to me. Do your own homework because that's the most important thing. Look it up for yourself. It's all out there. It's all there. All you got to do is do a little bit of page turning, button clicking, mouse clicking, whatever you got to do to get it. Okay? Look, that's the show tonight. Uh, Foo and Order, you're gearing it up right now. I promise you they're getting it ready to entertain you for the next hour. Then America off the rails after them. If you like the show, tell your friends. If your friends like the show, get new ones. But they and you are welcome right here every week with me on KLRN Radio for the conservative curmudgeon show. I'm your host, The Grouch. Peace. God I bless. I this place. Nothing works here. The medications don't work. <laughs> I've been here for seven years. to us.